Welcome to the British Library. And the big news here is that our epic new exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, is now open to the public. So if you live in London town, what are you waiting for? Tonight, though, we're online. Um, I'm B. Rolat of the Cultural Events team, and we're bringing together both sides of the Atlantic to celebrate a new book. It's called Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts by Dr. Rebecca Hall and artist Hugo Martinez. Buy the book, it's available here right now, you just click. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of work as you're about to hear, not only for the important story that it relates, but also for the story behind that and of what this cost Dr. Hall to research and to write and to guide us through this double story I'm delighted to welcome back a friend of the British Library, the renowned critic, playwright, broadcaster, and a non-stop beacon of brightness, Bonnie Greer. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you, thank you, Bea. And it's really always great to be back at the, the British Library. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I just wanna say that this is a great honor to be able to do this tonight, uh, not only because it's the British Library, but because, um, I did a podcast in 2019 called In Search of Black History for Audible UK. And one of the contributors was Dr. Rebecca Hall, whose book uh, we're talking about and celebrating tonight, Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts. I always show the book. And the illustrator artist, Hugo Martinez is with us as well. And I just wanna say, and I never say this, uh, Rebecca changed my life. And so I'm sort of trembling at, in a way to do this and sure I will mess up in, in, in every capacity, but uh, she changed my life and changed my thinking about Africa, uh, about my ancestors who like hers were enslaved Africans and, um, and about the slave ships. And I do mean totally change it. So I wanna just get right into this. I just wanna also say, um, Rebecca's at the Schomburg in Harlem, the, the great uh, library of African-American history and research uh, is the British Library of African-America. And Hugo is in New Orleans, where we all wish we was, except the hurricanes are coming. So anyway, this is, this is the, the difference and the link that we're doing. So let's just get right to this. And, you know, Rebecca, you begin this book and, I wanna say that this book is your journey mm -hmm. and becomes Hugo's journey as well as he takes on the, the, the job, the task, the, the, the work of, of, of rendering you and your feelings and what you see and your stories into visual. And I wanna to talk to him about that just a bit. But you begin this by saying, I am an historian and I am haunted. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um well, yeah, like you said, you know, being the descendants of enslaved people, um, I have, um, my paternal grandparents were actually born in slavery. Um, my grandmother was born on a plantation in Missouri and my grandfather was born on a plantation in Tennessee, both in 1860. And so the idea that slavery was something that was really far away or, you know, um, my own personal story belies that, you know, I mean, there's a huge generation skip in my family. Uh, you know, it's kind of unusual to be, you know, my age, which is like 58 and have grandparents who were born uh, enslaved. But the fact that it's possible should let people understand that we're talking about recent, recent history. And um, here in, in the United States, I, I, it's hard for me to speak about the UK in particular, but here in the United States, um, the whole country is haunted by the legacy of slavery and uh, being in the wake of slavery and um, you know, not having had any kind of truth and reconciliation or any kind of coming to terms with, with, with this history um, you know, really kind of poisons this country in a lot of ways. You know, that's, that's, you know, when you talk about the complications of it, um, 
you know, I always tell people never go on Ancestry.com because it's just the worst. And um, I found out that one of my ancestors, who was a man of African descent, actually owned African people himself. Ooh. Ooh. So, you know, that's a whole other voyage down the horror horror trail. Um, you go tell me about yourself because you're new for me. I know I know a bit about Rebecca. But tell me about yourself. You're muted. There you go. I had to, had to unmute myself. There's trucks coming by and didn't want that to uh, invade the sound. Um, I, I was born in California um, to Nick Rogman family. Um, you know, I, part of what was really fascinating to me about this story is just, you know, I have had women in my life that were revolutionaries and, and you know, there is a, a kind of a, a kindredship that I, I saw in this story uh, with regards to that. And I would think about that family often when I read the script and read uh, Rebecca's papers. And, um, and anyway, that's, that's part of my, my passion for this book. Uh, but I, I, was, I grew up in California. I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for almost 20 years. And then I moved to New Orleans about seven or eight years ago. Um, and in that period of time, I guess I was always interested in, in, in telling stories visually. Um, I would, I did a graphic design for a while and that was some of what helped shape how I did things in, in this project. Um, and, and then I, I delved into doing illustration, um, doing that just kind of on my own, a lot of like uh, uh, a lot of independent publishing on my part of stories that I felt had resonance with resistance and with um, uh, issues addressing a lot of the oppressive uh, foreign policies that the U.S. has has created. You know, this this book, um, thank you for that, Hugo. This book, I forgot to also add that Rebecca is a lawyer and um, law, law is in my family. So I'm always interested in lawyer heads, you know, lawyer <laughs> minds. Uh, lawyer minds always fascinated me and fascinate me. And this book is got not only the dogged sort of intensity of an historian, it's got a lawyer's intensity. Uh, you have cases you want to examine, you're knocking on doors, you're going up and asking people, uh, you know, what, what happened to this? And, and the precision and the preciseness of your asking about these records are, are really takes it out of the historian's quest into you're trying to, um, you have a case that you're trying to prove. And you start off with being a lawyer and you start off with looking at how your African-American women plaintiffs, the plaintiffs were treated in different cases. Can you tell us a tiny bit about that and how that sparked you to go back and get your PhD in another area? Yeah, so I practiced law for eight years in Oakland, California. I did, I worked with- You need to talk about Oakland, uh, Oakland, because that's a very special place to practice law. <laughs> <at home. laughs> uh, yeah, I, I moved there from New York because I went to Berkeley Law and I stayed, I stayed there. But um, I worked with low-income tenants and um, I kept finding all these kind of deformations in the legal process that was hard to put kind of a name on because, you know, you're taught that, I mean, I didn't think, you know, it, it, I could perform miracles as a lawyer, but, but, but I thought that there would be some sort of basic justice. And, you know, I'd have cases where I'd have white plaintiffs and black plaintiffs and it'd be the exact same facts. And the black plaintiffs would get half the damages. Um, and, you know, things like this, or, you know, I would go into a courtroom and I would not be read as the attorney. I'd be read as like some criminal de defendant. So um, I got really sick of that and I wanted to, you know, understand it more. And so I went back and did seven more years of postgraduate education <laughs> to get this PhD. 
But it, Bonnie, if, if it's okay with you, I, I'd like to respond to, to what you were saying about building a case. Um, you know, that, that's a historian's art as well, but I appreciate you sort of teasing out how the lawyer part, because it really is about interrogating <laughs> these sources. Um, you know, I, you know, if we want to talk just a little bit about the of slave ship revolts and women's involvement in that, I, I can. But you know, before you get there, because that's mm -hmm. the creme de la creme of everything. That's really what changed me, and I want to get to that. I want to stay with a tiny bit with the lawyer part because one of my sort of pet peeves. Uh, and I, I've said this to you and I've said this to you, Hugo, a lot of people are teaching black history and running around talking about black history, but they haven't got a lot of facts. You know, they have a lot of, you know, facts mixed with fantasy, mixed with people's uh, um, ideas about things. And, and you've been very dogged about facts. You really want to know what are the facts? What really happened? I, and, and, and to go back to thinking about you and that, that lawyer head, I mean, I just loved you pursuing Dom Regina. Can you explain <laughs> that? Because a lot of people don't know what that means and what it means in relation to not only our ancestors, but to the United States of America itself. Yeah, well, okay. So um, I, I look, the book opens, I look at two uh, revolts that happened early in the 1700s when in New York City when it was a um, colony of England. Um, and I, 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 the main, the primary sources I had were court records. And um, the, the Dom Regina, the queen, who at that point was Queen Anne, I believe. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, her name is repeatedly invoked. Um, uh, in legal documents, almost to create some kind of jurisdiction, some kind of power, uh, you know, where the, the language uh, becomes a, an instantiation of the power. Um, and the crime against uh, the state is the crime against the queen and, you know, the crime of revolt. Um, so there's a, there's a, an, an image in the, in the book <laughs> uh, where um, I don't know if folks can, can see this, where you know I'm looking through the documents and there's so much of the text is spent just talking about Dom Regina, you know, defender of the faith, and you know, and I, you know, paragraph after paragraph about, you know, oh, and then and so little, you know, and it, actually to none of the voices of the enslaved people. And and that and that tells us, and that's that's what was so moving to me is that you're piling through these documents looking for human beings, looking for voices, and it becomes even more in the book, so powerful. And Hugo's drawing of you, like just, you know, fighting this through, that it just becomes very obvious that this is property, people. We're talking about property, and we talk, we talk a lot about, we, we use the term slaves as property, but in your book, uh, you show what that really, really means, how people are treated, how they, when they come up before the law, how they're executed, why they're executed, what happens with women in particular. And you find an old statue that goes back to, I think, to Edward III or something, where if a woman kills her husband, she's committed treason. And so she's executed. And then that's doubly done if you're uh, African a woman of African descent, your property. So all of this sort of complexity starts to come in as you explore slave revolts in New York City. Mm -hmm. Mostly we think about slavery as happening and slave revolts as happening in the South. Mm -hmm. You're up North. Right. Or we don't think about slave revolts at all. You know, uh, <laughs> the, I mean, they're hardly taught. Um, but yes, and that's one of the reasons why I, I focused my research on, on New York City, besides being a New Yorker, I'm from New York. Um, but it's so important for people to understand that slavery was all over British America um, and that slavery was also an urban phenomenon. It was a Northern phenomenon and, and that enslaved people were, they were a fifth of the population in the time period that I'm looking in the early 1700s. 
and they helped build this 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 city and it's and it's you know and it's it's the financial capital of the United States. You know, some argue the world, um, and you know, it, it's important for people to understand the role of the enslaved um, in creating the city. How can you tell us one story about New York? Because that, again, th that really changed me a lot when I learned about these women and what they tried to do and what happened to them in New York? Sure, um, there, there's a revolt in, that happened in, in 1712. Um, and th there are a few articles written about it and there, there's a book chapter here and there written about it that all describe the, the people in, involved as men. Um, but uh, what, what, I, I, what I found was correspondence with the colonial governor of New York to the Privy Council, um, describing the revolt and talking about uh, a, a one woman who was pregnant, whose, whose execution was suspended uh, because she was pregnant, because that baby belonged to somebody, right? It's property. Um, and uh, I was like, well, if there was one woman, maybe there were more women. And I, I went to look at the, at the court records and yes, there were, there were more women involved in, in that revolt. And, um, you know, they, they got together, they, they made a pack of, pact of secrecy um, and they lit a building on fire. And as people, which was, you know, fire was a really big deal in that time period, you know, you could level an entire city. And as um, the white people came to, to put the fire out, they killed them as they came. And, and then they fled um, and uh, some probably escaped, I don't know, but there were, you know, 21 people tried and, you know, and executed, so. What, what was it like, Hugo, for you um, when you got the text and you, you, you know, with your own activism, your own interest in the things that you know, Rebecca are talking, is talking about resistance, all of that. How did you draw these women? They have a very particular look and you, you feel as if something is happening inside that you drew them from the inside in a sense. So I, I, I think there was a combination of what's inside and, and then looking at reference as well. Um, you know, there was a lot of reference that, uh, that you know, Rebecca sent to me of, um, of what the clothing and attire was for enslaved people of that time. Um, and, and then I had to delve a little bit to like, to try to create variety within that or, or try to find the different varieties of, of, of style because it wasn't all uniform um, and you, know, you need that also to, to just depict individuals. Um, and so there was that. And, and then uh, I, I tried to look at images of, of women from West Africa and, and try to uh, and just design characters that, that would fit the description of who, who they were in the story. You, but um, their faces, you go, what, what struck me, what really is such a perfect kind of, it's not illustration, it's a text itself. The, the women look like they're lit from within, mm -hmm. almost as if they are lit, uh, like you put a fire or a lamp inside of them, which I found uh, incredible, really. Um, because there, were, there are a lot, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an illustrator, how do I know? But I mean, there are a lot of ways you could, you could do a lot of stuff with this. And if you hear the word graphic novel and people go, oh, I don't, you know, my, when I, when you first, when I knew you were taking your research and you wanted to go down that route, I thought, well, no, we're making it all. But, you know, it, no, because I did, I just thought, I just want to read it. But what you've done is you haven't illustrated it. You've added another layer to Rebecca's quest, her story. You've even made her into this part of these women as well, because she does begin saying she's haunted and she's haunted all the way through. And you see her standing at library, like looking into the distance, like basically her face is saying, what? 
and, and knocking on doors and pursuing. And you create all of these women, especially with this light. And, am I overstating that in a sense? Because I do do things like that. I mean, it's, it's so flattering to hear that that's how they're perceived. I, I think um, they became characters in, internally uh, for sure. Um, they were, you know, there were people that I wanted to get to know um, as I drew them because they were, they were, you know, they're, they had to come alive somehow. Um, and, and I, yeah, I, I think they, they had to have, you know, some kind of expression. And, and I, I think, you know, for me, I think that a lot of that comes through in their facial expression um, and, and their, and their amazing. gestures. They're amazing. They're amazing. They're amazing. I, I want to say, yes, I just want to say about the title because a lot of people were getting messed up over this because, you know, it's like over here, like it is in America. I don't even want to say the word because I'm tired of saying it because it's a beautiful word. Woke is a beautiful word. It's one of the one of the signs of the Underground Railroad that people use and it's just been debased. But this book is called Wake. Mm -hmm. And it is, and at first, before I understood Rebecca's explanation, I thought wake was the wake of the slave ship. It I is. mean, which is, oh, oh. I ooh, mean, that's the thing. Okay. It has multiple okay. valences, right? And also the wake of slavery. You say that in exactly. the wake of that. Mm -hmm. But for me, visually, I saw the wake of the slave ship, which is where I feel I live. Right. right. Wow, that's powerful. And that's that's what we're trying to 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 convey. So wake has this multiple valences, right? It's the wake of the ship. It's living in the wake of slavery. A wake is a way to honor the dead. Um, and yeah, so the yeah. book does all of, all of those things that was, was, you know, was the, was the goal. And can I just say one thing about graphic novels? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think um, th that particular medium that, that allows for, you know, text, which is linear, and then art, which is kind of all at once, um, lets you do things that you can't do in other mediums. Yes. Um, and uh, some of the most powerful works like Mouse by Art Spiegelman or, or uh, The Holocaust, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and in order to tell these intertwined stories, right, because I'm telling the stories of these women in revolt, and I'm telling the story of my researching the revolt, and I'm telling the story about living in the wake of slavery. This is a lot of intertwined things. And so, and the graphic novel medium is really important for that. Um, there's, there, there's an image uh, of me uh, kind of almost like passed out in an archive and, yes. and reaching for me. I think we have this image, uh, uh, but I mean, I'll just show in the, in the, in the book. Um, before this, uh, there's a revolt on a slave ship and, um, you know, these women end up overboard and, they, and uh, th their hands sort of reach for me and in the archive and, it, and, where I, and I say, I'm a historian and I'm haunted. And so this layer of past, present and future, um, the graphic novel medium is perfect for doing that. Can you tell us, Rebecca, thank you for that. Can you tell us the story of the Negro Fiend? Uh, yeah, that's a very frustrating story. Um, so I um, uncovered a revolt that, uh, uh, that I had discovered my, myself that occurred in what's now Elmhurst, Queens, but at the time was called Newtown. Um, and uh, it was led by a woman um, the records are, are, are sparse and there are big gaps, but, you know, we have correspondence uh, from the colonial governor again to the Privy Council explaining what happened. There's uh, uh, newspaper articles and they refer to the woman who led this revolt as the Negro fiend or sometimes the Negro wench. And I was really wanting to find her name. Um, and I thought if I could get hold of the court records, I could find her name um, and there was a trial and she was found guilty and she was burned at the stake and um, her name would have been documented in those court records, but I could not get access to those court records. 
Um, and that you said, I mean, you you talked about the historian's worst nightmare. I mean, you used that phrase. I don't know yeah. if it was in relation to the Negro fiend, but you just said at one point you were caught up in the historian's worst nightmare, which is what? With what? What is the? It's just you know, like trying to find, trying to put the story together. You know, trying to bring these people to life, and 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 just having huge pieces of the record missing, you know, and, and, you know, it, the records, records are missing for a lot of reasons, but if you're going to talk about enslaved women in the 1700s, um, there were very few records of them at all. You know, they weren't considered something that you would even create a document about. Um, yeah. And you know what changed what, what changed me before we talk about coming over to these shores, which was one of my favorites um, of your adventures. I mean, th this really should be a, a series. I don't know who would play you. Maybe you should play yourself. It, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, what really changed me and really made me rethink Africa, made me rethink black history, made me rethink black women in history and women in history period was when I was growing up in the 60s, you know, all these movies were coming out about slave revolts on ships and it was all guys. So the women were like tied up underneath the boat and being very frail and frightened. And the men were up at the top fighting. Now, what you made me rethink is that's actually illogical. If you think about the fact that why would they want men unchained on the top of the ship when they were the strength? They were, I mean, you got these young guys, why would you want them unfettered? But you wouldn't mind having the women untethered because they're women and that's that whole idea of womanhood. What are they going to do? Blah, blah, blah. Right. right. So yeah, um, this is a really important part of the book and an important part of my, of my research. And, uh, the, it's first of all, it's very important to understand that the slave trade, the British slave trade, was a business. It was highly regulated. Um, there were business practices, um, and 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 those documents exist. And um, historians, you know, once the internet was available, historians who studied slave the slave trade. Um, you know, some, some quantitative historians came together and created this incredible database that, that's free to access online, the Atlantic Slave Trade Database, with other, over 35,000 voyages of slave ships. And um, you can search that database. And, they, you know, these historians searched it, and they found that there was a revolt on one in 10 of these ships, which was completely unexpected because slave ship revolts are mainly almost a kind of suicide. Um, and then they compared the ships that had revolts with the ships that didn't have revolts. And the only difference they could find is that the more women there were on a ship, the more likely there would be a revolt. Let's and freeze that for a minute. No, it, but let's freeze that for a minute because I, I want you to say that again, because that is the turnaround point for me. That was the icebreaker. That was the revolution <laughs> when you said that in your research talk with my, for my podcast. Can you just say that again? Because people need to hear that. It's very important. Right. The more women there were on a ship, the more likely there would be a, a slave ship revolt. And these historians who did this research dismissed this as some kind of fluke because they, they knew that women didn't, weren't involved in this kind of activity. So when I came to England to research, um, you know, records about slave ships, uh, which were captain's logs and surgeon's logs and all kinds of, you know, paperwork documenting uh, slave ship voyages and slave ship revolts. Why are they documenting this? Because slave ships are insured. They're insured, you know, um, there's actually was an insurance provision that Lloyds of London and other, you know, slave ship insurers created that was called the insurrection of cargo. So <laughs> if there was a revolt on your ship, you needed to turn in the documentation if you're going to get your insurance claim. Sorry, that was, a, I, that was a tangent. No, 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 no. This, this, this is what changed me to know this. I might name my production company Insurrection of Cargo because of that. <laughs> and the fact that the fact that 
Lloyd's of London. And this is what I, I try to say uh, to people. When you're talking about tearing down statues, that's well and good, but you have to understand that every brick, <laughs> waterfall, and the stuff under your feet is imperial and colonial, everything that this country was built on it, literally brick by brick by brick. And, and Lloyds of London, uh, which came literally into being to ensure slave ships well, against, well, partly their, their policy came into being. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they were a very early maritime insurer and slave ships was a big part of that business. Um, and women were, and women, I mean, at one point you talk on my podcast about one, one group of women actually turned a ship around about three or four times. They were going back to Africa and they kept, the ship just turned around until well, they stopped it basically. Okay, I think in order to understand what's going on on these slave ships, it's really important to understand the business practices of the Royal African Company. Um, and the way it was set up was that once a ship left the coast of Africa, um, before it left the coast, every enslaved person, all the captives were below deck and uh, chained. Once the ship left the coast, um, the women were unchained and brought on deck. Um, right. And so, uh, when I kept reading these captain's logs and would read actually sort of, you know, detailed stories of revolts, there were things like everything from, we had another revolt today, but uh, we keep checking the men's chains. I don't understand how that's happening. I mean, there were no men who got free or, or more specifically, like uh, the women got the men free of their chains or, you know, the women grabbed the weapons from the armory chest, which was also on deck, you know, and, and started this revolt. And, and there was a revolt on the ship, the Unity. There were four revolts that happened on that one voyage. And um, there were women involved, you know, documented in the captain's log in, in, in all of them. Um, so, you know, you, you, you talk about, I mean, it's not actually hilarious, but it actually kind of is when you come to London and you're just trying to get some answers. That's all. I mean, not trying to cause any problems. You just want somebody to answer you. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, that's a, a movie in and of itself. I mean, I love when you went into the Africa gallery at the British Museum and called it a crime scene. And I thought, you know, that is really incredibly ironic because you've inspired me to actually go back to the British Museum and do my project there with the director of the British Museum. So, you know, we, we're, we're in there and, and, and you're one of the genesis and he sends his greetings to you. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. It's, so you you walk through London, at, you know, with your same dogged, intense scrutiny uh, and and passion about trying to just find the story, trying to find the story as an historian, trying to find the story as a detective, trying to find the story as a lawyer, and trying to find the story as a descendant of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And and you talk a lot about what I feel about the duty to the ancestors, the ancestral duty. Can you talk us through that a bit? Yeah. Um, I was uh, at a protest, well, I was at a lot of protests uh, <laughs> last summer, um, and I saw this woman wearing a t-shirt, and I think I've seen these t-shirts in other pictures, but the t-shirt said something like, this isn't, um, my, this isn't my ancestors uh, uprising, you know? And, you know, the, the, the idea being that, you know, we are going to be more radical and confrontational than our ancestors who, who were not. And that made me so sad because, you know, black history is not taught in this country and African-American people don't know their history. And our history is filled with resistance. That is how we survived 400 years and thrived. Um, and, that, and the part of, of the book that's, that, that's about awake, about honoring the dead, you know, about us needing to have a, 
a memory that's longer than our lifespans. Um, th this is like a crucial part, you know, of this book. And there, there was an image, uh, it was actually um, of a woman emerging from the water uh, after she went overboard in, in the Unity. And I actually had, I dreamed that There image. it is, there, yes. I dreamed that image. Yes. Um, and I, I woke up and I called Hugo and I was like, I had this dream, can you draw it? <laughs> you know? And he kept trying like over, like it, he would come up with something and I'm like, no, no, that's not quite it, that's not quite it. And then like, you know, then he, he got it, he got it. And I was like, exactly, you know, for the future, you know, this, th this woman, you know, who, uh, who, who was, you know, thrown overboard in the process of initiating a revolt, you know, she's back, you know, <laughs> she's back you know, through this work and she's gonna bring us into the future. And I, I think what terrifies me a little bit, and I'm glad you brought up that march, and it's the terror of an elder. And 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 on one point, you watch the gen I watch generations now, young people, and you know, I stand back, you know, because I know everybody's got to go through their own definition of the moment that they're in. And the historical moment that they end that I, I took that moment in 68 when I was a teenager and they're taking that moment now. But, you know, the fact that there's so the, it, it's so ahistorical that it, it's shocking in a way. And and you think, you know, how are we going to go forward if people don't know about the past, if they don't know that our whole history is resistance. Our whole, our whole life is about resistance. I, I, I work with Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party and you couldn't tell me 50 years ago that I would be talking about some of the things I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, the, the, the arc of history is, as, as Dr. King said, is a long one. And I feel one of the contributions that your book has made and what and your and Hugo's work is to remind people of the legacy of resistance. That's how we're here. Mm -hmm. That's how we're breathing. We weren't a bunch of passive people yeah. sitting around getting beat up and trying to figure out who am I gonna do next? And we and, and we come from warrior women as well, not just women who, you know, this ain't gone with the wind. This, this, and, and even, even- Which I've never even, seen and won't Exactly, see. but even, <laughs> even the people who played in Gone with the Wind, they were warrior women. They just took the money and took that thing. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I want to, I love the fact that you made a book about warrior women and you made a book about women being erased from history as a sustainable, Systemic, systematic part of what the historical record is, where historians would look at this 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 information and go, "No, it's women. I don't believe that. I don't buy it." Or in my time, let's keep the women down because we need to bring the brothers up a little bit more because all this stuff is happening. And women still were but, sort of put in their their but place. But that's not an or. That's the cause. What you're describing. Of, of, of we've got to keep the women down and put the men up is why all of this historical work written about slave revolts, like this was the first generation of historians, you know, black men writing about revolt um, in the context of the late 60s and 70s, when all of the discourse was about how black people had dysfunctional gender roles and black women were emasculated. And, and so, the, so the discourse back against it was this, no, black women are are behind and quiet and et cetera, you know, and and so uh, uh, these historians who are writing these history this history in this time period are writing things like, of course, women weren't involved in this revolt. Women exactly. in Africa were in a separate private sphere, like they were here. It's like no, they weren't. Like you don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah. You know, and 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 you know, th there is very developed martial tradition of women in, in Africa. You know, not in all nations by by any means, but the homie, you know, which you talk in the homie. Right. Well, yes, but there's also you know stories of you know evil women defending their village from slave raiders. There's, I mean, there's a there, there there's a it, you know it, it's not just Dahomey. Dahomey is a very uh, intense case because you know they were fielding an army of 10,000 women that that that's something that um yeah it's a it's a, it's a unique case 
Is it true that they they were the women who wound up in Haiti and actually the French had to take them on? I mean, they were um, they were they were warrior cast, and they just thought they were just women who were just laying around, you know, whatever they thought, and then found out that they were confronting, you know, warriors basically, soldiers, and didn't know that that's they were fighting. Yeah, you know, so there there's been some recent work done on that where you know a lot of the people who were uh, sold as captives were war captives. Yes. So, you know, like one army would defeat the other army army and then they would like, you know, sell all the war captives, you know, into the trade. And so, you know, there would be entire slave ships full of warriors, you know, men and women. Um, and then they would get to Cuba or Haiti or Jamaica or whatever. And, and yeah, you de there's definitely more I, I mean, this is sort of beyond the Caribbean is beyond my, <laughs> but the, there's been some interesting work done in that area. You know, one last observation before we go to questions, if we have any. Um, your work, particularly about women on slave ships, developed, helped me develop a theory that I'm working on at the British Museum, and I call it Meta Africa. And to me, the use of the word diaspora is too dainty in a way. I mean, it's too benign, it's too genteel. And, and for me, the fact that these were nations on these ships, these weren't just black people and they were anonymous, these were nations. And they, some of them were, were enemies and they were on these ships together and they were starting to, uh, they had to find a way to survive together. They had to find a language together. They had to find a way to be together and to survive. And it creates within all of us, I think, who are of African descent outside of Africa, this incredible, I call crisis competence where we just, we survive, we make it. We know how to do that because we survived that passage. And um, I wanna thank you for that because that that really, that's the part that really, really uh, changed. Uh, my whole way of thinking. And I, Rebecca, you, you talk about Chicago. I mean, that's my hometown. Did. You did you? Did you talk about, you talked about some, you had a Chicago, there was something that said Chicago or one of your relatives were. Uh, you go, you're there? nodding your head. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember this is- uh, Yay, see, I'm not crazy, right, okay. What, you go. The, at the end of, I think, chapter six or chapter five, where um, where your grandmother is moving to Chicago from yes, Nebraska. Yes. Rebecca. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm halfway through another book. <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the, this is a lot. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Chicago is in this book. Thank you, Hugo. <laughs> I thought so. I thought it was going crazy. Right. Yeah, but I wanted to, I just wanted to, to respond just a little bit to what you were saying about Meta Africa. I think, you know, historians really, you know, are studying the Atlantic world, like understanding the relationship between Europe and all of its nations and Africa and all of its nations and the Americas. Um, it's a very complex inter interwoven history that can't be broken down into what we see as, as nation states. And right. so, um, you know, this history is fascinating, it's intriguing, um, and there's always more, always more to learn, and that's how, and uncover, and that's, that's the historian's craft, you know, the historian's craft is to, to uncover the history. And also to, to uncover the history, but also to tell the story yeah. in a way that you have to honor the story, which you do brilliantly, both of you, Thank both you. of you but also you leave the door open, which is what somebody like me, even though I read history at the undergraduate level and have always been a student of history, you, left the, you leave the door open for investigation, you leave the door open for adventure, and you leave the door open for, I'm gonna use a baseball term, left field thinking in some kind of way. <laughs> because, because in a sense, we are all children of a kind of line about being, you know, the descendant of enslaved. And some of those lines, some of that line is necessary to have 
in order for, I guess, the narrative to keep going. But there's so many, there's so much nuance. There's so much layer. There's so many layers. There's so much um, hidden history that I think would change the game if it came up. I mean, it's particularly about uh, what women and the, and, and the role of women on those slave ships, I think would be a total revolution. It totally revolutionized Bonnie, me. Bonnie, get me into Lloyd's of London. Get get me. Girl, we both archive. going in there. I don't know how we're we gonna do it. But and we're and we're gonna uncover some more more stories. We we have to because I think those stories and and to look at the role of women um, in this whole story of enslavement is key. Rebecca, what was the hardest thing for you to do? I mean, what was just the hardest that you faced, that you found out, that you that you had to chase up? I think reading um, reading so many slave ship captains' logs when I was in London, um, like doing that like seven, eight hours a day for you know two months, uh, and you know Hugo, there's a there's a there's a drawing, you know, of that Hugo created of the Brooks diagram. Um, I don't know if somebody can can pull that up, but um, you know, this is a diagram. I think that people uh, might be, you know, familiar with. But what people don't understand is that diagram that shows. I'm trying to find it in the book. That that shows. Uh, yeah, that that shows. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, the proper stowage of captives or cargo on a slave ship. Can you ship. talk us through it, Rebecca? Can you talk us through it? Yeah, it, it, it is actually, you know, people think this was some kind of abolitionist document to show how horrible the slave trade was, but it was actually created by parliament to regulate and ameliorate the conditions on slave ships. And this was the law about how many captives you could put on a ship and how you could quote store the cargo you know and then abolitionists took it up to show you know how 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 horrible how hor horrible that was and hugo i mean you could talk about if we have time i don't know but you know how difficult it was for you to to draw that yeah i think you know the, the whole process of of drawing you know you, you draw more than once you know you you create a storyboard, you do your drawing, and then you ink it. So I, you know, I went over the images several times, and this one was particularly difficult to go through. I, I mean, there was a lot that was that was very just uh, impactful and 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 hard to to express. Um, and and that one in particular, you know, I, I read, you know, I read the book as a reader, um, and and I, you know, I was hearing up um, just, just looking at it. And the, the same went for when I was when depicting that image. Um, and just, you know, what you're saying about, about how this is just, uh, the, this is what, what was intended to be the safer and better practices of, of, of uh, using people as cargo. And mm -hmm. seeing, I don't know, I, I, there was something about seeing what people were experiencing as they were treated as cargo, um, that that just really was overwhelming for me to to, to experience and and you know looking at it and drawing it, um, I, I kept, I, you know I don't know I think this one took me a long time to to. to I was going to ask you about that, um, but you chose to do it. Yeah. Well, I, I asked him to do it. <laughs> right, right, but but he chose, but he did it. You know, he did yes. it, yes. and and yes. and and you went through that voyage. Hugo, do you have another image that you like to show us that that tells us a bit about your process as well? Because um, I love the images you have of Rebecca, which I I think are just amazing and captures her inner self, as far as I I understand that to be, but. There, there are honestly a lot. <laughs> but, well, let's uh, just see that you want to show the burial, the the one I think yeah, it's the last yeah. image. Um, yeah. So this is part of the that valence of wake as an honoring the dead, right? And so 
uh, that's me in the in the center, <laughs> and you know I'm I'm surrounded by enslaved people in uh, what was called the Negro burying ground, which is in downtown New York, um, and that was destroyed. Did, did that go at nine eleven? Is that still no, there? No, 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 no. Um, and uh, Hugo and I went to. It's now a national monument. Hugo, Hugo and I went there and you know took photos and spent time and and I think that really informed right Hugo the way that you that you depicted yeah. depicted that Definitely. and to be and to be in the middle of that to put her Hugo in that in that image was a kind of an expression of where or how you felt actually about her Rebecca's I guess I was gonna say role, but her movement through this story, through history. Um, I, I think uh, you know, we actually took a photograph of of Rebecca where, where there's an installation at that museum where where there are like figures standing around a burial site, um, and it, it's it's really a really moving photograph um, that that you know had to be captured. In this book, I, I felt, mm -hmm. um, and and you know, I, Rebecca referenced it in in the in the script when she gave it to me, and you know, I agreed that this this was the image that that really um, connects that that image of the past and, and the present um, as as coexisting. And so much about this book is about how the the present has not left the past, and 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 we need to. We need to reckon with it continually, mm -hmm. um, and 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 I think that image is one of those that that really is able to capture that, um, along with this um, the this this loving connection that Rebecca has with with all of these historical people that that you know are that she and other historians are are, are trying to bring to bring back to life. Can we see one of her images of, of, of the one you got? You got several that are very striking of Rebecca, who's sort of standing in. It's not a void because there are things around, but her her quest is evident in and, and that I've never seen that before. In, in any kind of a book that's illustrated and the authors involved, I've never seen that kind of, I guess, nakedness in a way where she's standing and she's stuck and she's also raging at the same time. And you draw her body and, and, and her head in a particular way. And she's looking almost at us saying, we have to do something here, but I don't even, but they're stopping me. But but why oh, you got one you got one <laughs> you know but while but while but while you're looking I I think I, I I would like to say as we we're wrapping up that and 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 to show the drawing show the image is that Rebecca for me you are role model because you got on this path by yourself now you have people there are people on it there are people who have done things before there are people who are doing things mm -hmm. so you aren't alone mm -hmm. in that sense. But you did get on that path from another space and you decided, as you said at the beginning of your book, I am haunted. Mm -hmm. And you followed that haunt. And I think it's an inspiration for anybody, mm -hmm. particularly women of color, particularly black women, to start where you are, start where you are and do your work. If you feel what your work is, do it. And there it is, that's it. And that that's the one where she's standing there basically asking the question into the ethos, into history, into the void, into the future. You know, basically, what why don't I, why isn't all this known? Where are the records? What's happening? What's happened? Why is this erasure? And you talk about erasure, and I talk about erasure too. That part of what's what, what the intention of uh, of our of historians in relation to us is erase erasure. The slavery was erasure as well. Yeah, I mean this this image here about being in the wake of the slave ship, where I say, you know, I was born to tell these stories, um, 
and I think, uh, I mean, it kind of addresses what, what you were saying. Um, I think a lot of the kind of haunting of history, we experience it like almost, you know, like out of the, I talk about in the book, like catching something out of the corner of your eye, but you can't quite see it. And in order to really be able to put it front and center so you can see what's going on, you know, for me, that meant studying it. And staring it in the face as much as you, as much as you, uh, were able to do it and and also to deal with whatever you had to confront with because you've got images of um you got images if if we can see those of you standing up in front of people i mean it's not funny but it, you're standing there being obstructed i mean just basically people are obstructing you mm-hmm. and you go as recorded these basically guys saying you know i'll tell i'll show you what i want to show you or I don't know what you're talking about, and their English is quite interesting. But do you have you have um <laughs> you you have an image of, of one of these guys standing there and just basically uh, telling Rebecca, you know, I, this is all I'm going to tell you. I, I show you what I want to show you. These belong to us, not to you. And these records, I, you know, I will divulge what I want to divulge. Are you talking about the Lloyds of London experience? Yeah. Yeah, very, very frustrating experience. <laughs> I tried to use all of my legal and historical skills to talk myself into this archive and it didn't work. They don't let people in there who are studying slavery. They just don't. And I understand that they've hired an internal archivist to, uh, to reckon with this legacy. And sorry for being, um, what's the word? Uh, there's a word. Uh, I don't believe them. I mean, I'm sure they're going to I'm sure they're going to you know, pull up a couple records and say, "See, we 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 dealt with this." But if they really want to reckon with the history of their involvement in the history of the slave trade, they should let in historians like myself. Yeah. And and I guess in a sense one of, one of my big arguments is that the thing with systemic racism and, and what's so dangerous about systemic racism and so elusive is that systemic racism can pass out a couple of ice cream cones and people think something has happened. Mm-hmm. And, and it hasn't because we haven't been able to burrow in to the structure, to look at the sinews, to look at the, the, the stuff that makes it what it is. And until we're able to do that and our allies are able to do that, then the system just keeps perpetuating itself and perpetuating itself and becomes a different shape, a different color. A couple of people get more jobs, more wards, whatever. But the same structure. And that's what structural exactly, means. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. you want to go into the structure and that's the issue mm-hmm. for them is the structure. Is Is there one more thing? Is there anything that the two of you want to say before we wrap? Because this is this is this is a discussion that is the time we had is too short to actually go into everything. The the forensic uh, activity, the the kind of thinking about it in in the legal way and also in the historical way and also in a poetic way uh, that both of you did in the pursuit. And that, that above all is the most important thing for me. This is the journey of also two artists and they use their tools and everything that they have that try to bring to the story of uncovering particularly uh, the story of African women and, and enslaved African women mm-hmm. and our ancestry of revolt, resistance and survival. Mm-hmm. I, I want to say that, you know, that Hugo draws everything by hand, right? I so can tell. all of I that is like pen, you know, pencil and then pen, and, oh, yeah. you know, and he poured his all into that, into that work. I can um, tell. Yeah. I can tell by the way, I can tell by the strokes. You, you, you can feel it as well. That it's like that. It's very, very sort of, that's what I meant by the manuscripts in the, in the, right. And the thing, that's, that's what, that's what Hugo was doing. I, I, um, I'm, this is an honor to meet you and I know we're going to meet each other in person and, um, you are an inspiration for me, even though I'm in a place that you call the crime scene, you know, sometimes, uh, <laughs> there, sometimes, there are a lot of crime scenes. <laughs> yes, you know, but sometimes you got to be there, you know, mm-hmm, and, absolutely. 
and it's 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 really important to to be in places i think to engage with the people who are there who want to be there and who are doing uh, uh the kind of work that we need now you know i'm i told you i'm like a technical oh <laughs> there's a question um <laughs> uh, Oh, this is interesting because I, I know uh, the people involved with the Reich Museum's big exhibit called Slavery. I mean, we, you know, I, I'm a museum person, so we don't talk about other museums at, at one museum, but it's massive. And this person wanted to know, have you ever uh, looked at Dutch slavery? That's our last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, my, you know, when you get a PhD in history, you have to specialize. Um, and, you know, my specialization is um, British America. And um, I haven't spent, I've read books about it. I know, you know, something, you know, about it. Uh, but it's not my area of, of expertise. Um, but, you know, the Dutch slave trade uh, was, was a real thing, you know, and there's, there's, there's plenty of work done on it you know, if you want to learn more about it. So. I, I just want to say thank you personally for inspiring me uh, as, a, as a Black woman, as a writer, as a, a former deputy chair of this, this great museum to see its beauty and to find the things inside of it that I can work with. Thank you very, very much for that. And Hugo, your I, you know, your incredible personal work and you can feel it when you, when you look at every page. Uh, it's personal, it's involved, it's deep and you extend Rebecca's story beautifully. And this book, um, Wake, it will change your life too. Uh, I just urge everyone to get it. You will not look at black history again in the same way after you read it. And so, I thank the British Library for this privilege of meeting one of my heroes. And thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank, thank you, Bonnie. Thank, thank you, you, Rebecca. Thank you, Hugo.